I want us to go direct to the word of God. And my message today um, is titled, or it is part one of the theme, Help My Unbelief. And the uh, part one um, is under the theme, The Unbelieving Generation. I want us to go to the book of Mark, chapter 9. Open with me. Um, in the book of Mark, chapter 9, from verse 14, town. I will read. When they came, I'm um, using NIV version. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Verse 19, where um, I want us to draw our topic from. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a conversion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, verse 23, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. I want us to go to verse 28. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kite can come out only by prayer. Some versions say um, prayer and fasting. Praise the Lord. Jesus comes from the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And they joined the nine of the disciples. And when they came, they found a crowd of people. And they were arguing. The crowd uh, the disciples and the crowd consisted the teachers of the law all the scribes and they were arguing and Jesus inquired what the argument was about and a man who was in the crowd and happens to be the father to the son told Jesus the argument had to do with his son whom he had brought uh, actually, uh, Mark's gospel says, I brought him to you, but your disciples could not uh, cast out the demon. And verse 19, Jesus tells them, O oh, unbelieving generation. Mark doesn't, actually, this story is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the three of them, they don't tell us whom or the category of people that Jesus called the unbelieving generation among the scribes, the disciples, and the crowd. But from the other parts of the Bible, we can see that all of them, the three categories of people, belonged to that group that Jesus is calling unbelieving generation. And I would like us to look at them, the three of them. And let's begin by looking at the scribes or the teachers of the law. Who are they? Why would Jesus call them unbelieving generation? As uh, I'm describing them, 
Number one, they were teachers of mosaic law. They devoted themselves into learning and teaching the law. They knew what the law said about these and what the law did not say about these. Uh, or the other one. Because of their knowledge of the law, they were highly esteemed and respected among uh, the people in the community. They were people who enjoyed authority and leadership. However, even though they were learned leaders, highly uh, respected, they did not believe in the authority of Jesus. Actually, they were usually offended by Jesus' teachings. If you read throughout the Bible, they were highly and largely responsible for Jesus' death together with the Pharisees and the high priests. Jesus knew their heart and he referred to them as hypocrites in other portion of scriptures. Their devotion to traditions dominated their obedience and faith in God. They honored God with their lips, but their heart were far from him. In some portion of scriptures, Jesus called them blind. And he said, "A blind man, if a blind man leads another blind man, they will fall. They lived in pretense of holiness rather than their true godliness. They were characterized by outward acts of righteousness as opposed to inward change. In fact, in the book of Luke uh, 2046, the Bible says that they liked to be greeted uh, outside the market. They held or they would sit in the important seats in the synagogue. They made lengthy prayers, but inside them they were hypocrites. It is out of that knowledge that they would argue with the disciples, probably to humiliate them because they were unable to drive out the demon from the sun. Their learning became a hindrance to their believing rather than a help. And does it ha uh, happen the same sometimes in our community? We regard people highly depending on what we think they know or what they tell us. But when you look at the, those people, there is no inward transformation. Praise the Lord. I would like us to look at the second category of these people that Jesus called unbelieving generation. And that is the disciples. Oh my goodness. People who had the privilege of being chosen by Jesus Christ from all walks of life. They walked with Jesus. You know, they wa walked with him from one place to the other. They had seen Jesus perform miracles. They had seen Jesus healing the sick. They had seen Jesus raising the dead, feeding the 5,000, casting out demons, calming the storm, walking over the water. They were actually, uh, if you read from, uh, I think, chapter 6, the Bible says that they were given authority over uh, demons and sickness. However, despite all these privileges, they were unable to cast out a demon, yet they were empowered. They had seen Jesus praying but as we read down there, Jesus told them, these things cannot be done, not unless you people pray. At some point, we would see them going to pray with Jesus, but they would sleep. Um, during the coming of the storm, Jesus called them, O ye of little faith. And 
what follows after that, actually we find them arguing about who will be the greatest. I mean, I, I'm wondering, don't they know for real what they were called for? Why are they arguing of the things that do not matter, yet the things that matter, you know, they don't pay attention to? And in this group of people, I find a group of people who is so ignorant of their position in the kingdom. I find a group of people who are not reliable. So long as the master is not there, they cannot be trusted by any activity that will bring glory to the master. At some point, I'm even wondering, why were they even arguing with the scribes? I mean, they, they should have actually have ran away. They have the power. And I'm trying to begin, maybe the father to the son knew that if I don't fight Jesus, the disciples would do the same thing as the as Jesus would do. I'm imagining how devastated Jesus was. So, uh, by seeing people who had bestowed so much into them, people he had mentored, but in this case, they are unable to solve the problems of the crowd. I would like us to look at the other category um, and that is the crowd represented by the boy's father the Bible says when Jesus asked the disciples what, you know, what is the argument about actually he is the one who answered and he told Jesus uh, I brought my son to you and my your disciples could not uh, uh, cast out the demon actually listen to what he says he even goes further to describe the condition of the son to Jesus um, verse 17 says a man in the crowd answered teacher I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit he is not only possessed by a spirit but it has robbed him of speech whenever it seizes him it throws him to the ground. He forms the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Praise the Lord. Luke's account tells us that he was the only son. And therefore, this man had lived with a demon-possessed uh, son since his birth. This was the condition of the son since childhood. And therefore this man, he desperately needed help. He had seen the demon trying to kill his only son. And at that point, I'm beginning to imagine, maybe he's trying to justify his reasons for not believing. I mean, I have seen it all. I have seen this demon trying to kill my son. His prob uh, problems most probably made him doubt God. And the doubts were exaggerated actually by the disciples' inability to help him. This is a man who is so desperate. Desperate for help. Living with, all, you know, with this kind of situation for so long. And I'm believing, maybe he was like, how can I believe in this Jesus? How can I believe in God? I mean, I have seen it all. And at that point, Jesus knowing all this, knowing the heart of every man who was in that crowd, he looked at them in frustration and told them, O oh, ye unbelieving generation. Matthew calls them faithless and perverse, unbelieving and perverse. And I would like us to pause at that point and ask ourselves, don't we have the same groups of people with us today? People who, who, who know so much, they know the law, 
they know how politics are run you know they know how to make money they know how to do things they know how to to, to make wealth and because of that you know they don't even see the need of believing in Jesus they don't see the need of believing in God people who just you know look for reasons to challenge the Christians and the men and women of faith because in their hearts they feel like we have authority we have power what does Jesus have to do with our lives anyway and i would like to tell you that people refuse to believe that what they don't want to believe in spite of evidence and many times we seek proof so that we may be comfortable in believing and that is when we get things worse because we do not understand so that we may believe we believe so that we may understand and the things of god cannot be understood by human mind the things of god sometimes beats logic they beat common sense and maybe if you are waiting to understand everything if you are waiting to you know to get everything to know everything you might end up not believing in god sometimes maybe we are like disciples walking with god but we are so powerless we don't understand our position in the kingdom of god you don't we don't perform our duties as 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 Christ would like us to because we are so comfortable anyway we are in church niko na kanisa i have a church where i attend and therefore anyway i have a church if i need something a pastor will pray for me if something will uh, need to be done he will come he'll do it we are just there we are just sit warm as we want to you know we want the warmth of fellowship yet we are doing nothing about it we are so comfortable maybe like disciples even praying and fasting fellowshiping has become an issue and all this demonstrates the attitude of the heart there is no way you can believe in jesus yet when we look at you when we when you look at me i don't demonstrate what jesus would be sometimes we have men and women who are like the the boy's father we magnify our problems we enumerate them nimepitia hii nimepitia hii nimepitia hii just to strengthen our faithlessness and i'm wondering when this man was telling jesus that you know this demon uh tried to to kill my son by throwing him into fire by throwing him into water does he, doesn't he know that he's talking to the fourth man who was you know the Jesus was the fourth man into the fire doesn't he know that he's talking to a man who comes the storm who walks over the waters Hallelujah. Bwana asifiwe. I don't know I don't know what what Jesus would see in us. I don't know what God would see in us when he looks at us. I don't know what is that that is hindering us from believing in God. I don't know maybe the pride and the achievements of life have has choked you know ourselves so much that even we cannot have a place for Jesus we cannot believe i don't know i don't know what jesus would see i'm about to finish and i don't know what is it that is 
making us not to believe in the sovereignty of God. I don't know what is it that that is making us not to believe in the power of God. What is it that is making us doubt God's promises and his ways? Sometimes I wonder, why do we believe so much on the things of the world, but we don't believe on the things of God? And I'm reminded one time our chemistry teacher tried to explain to us what an atom is, what a molecule is. And he looked at us and we were like, ah, molimu unasema, atom, molecule. And he told us. For you to get these things, just have faith. There is an atom, there is a molecule. So I cannot take you to the library and show you what a molecule is or an atom is. But yes, we have scientists who believe so much in science, but they don't believe in God. And that, that, that beats common sense anyway. How would you believe there is an atom and you can't believe there is Jesus? How, how, how do you believe that if you take a certain medicine, you get healed, but you don't believe in the Lord who gave you life? It's so devastating. It's so sad. Actually, the Bible says even the nature declares of the go- God's goodness. You don't have to look so you know too far. Just look at the nature. It declares of the glory of God. Maybe we are looking for a reason to believe in God. As I finish, I would like to ask to read in the book of Psalm 139. Verse 23 and 24. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. And the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Uh, I want to skip at B and go to verse 24. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I would like to invite us into a soul searching moment. That moment where you can tell God search my heart, O God. Search my heart and see whether there is any offensive thing. When you look at these people, they didn't have to kill for Jesus to call them hypocrites. I mean, uh, uh, an uh, unbelieving generation. In fact, for the teachers of the law, at some point in the Bible he says, there are people who tell others, do this, yet they will do the opposite. And that enough qualifies you to be an unbelieving generation. If you mislead other people to doing things that you yourself don't do. If in that position where you love God with your lips, but your heart is so far away from him, when he looks at you, he sees an unbelieving person. If you're that person who's just a follower of Jesus in quotes, when he looks at you, he sees an unbelieving generation. Actually, we find that the, the boy's father telling, you know, he was so faithless that even when Jesus wants to, 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 to cast the demon, he's telling Jesus, if you can, eh, ukiweza, and Jesus, you know, repeats those words, and he was like, if I can, and, it is, and he told him, it is possible to whoever who believes. Will you tell God to turn your eyes away from worthless things, just like his psalmist would say? What is what is it? Such a soul. Welcome Jesus in your soul. 
welcome him in your soul and tell him to search you and if there is anything that is offensive he will lead you into the ways of everlasting our lord is merciful as we prepare to listen to part 2 of that topic can you restart your soul invite christ in your soul he is able to illuminate those things that nobody can even see those things that pastor cannot see but they are hidden deep inside our hearts he is able he is able he is able i would like to welcome morris to come and conclude the word of prayer as we search our souls it's so sad if we put jesus in that devastating state when he looks at his people whom he has bought with his blood but he cannot see the faith that he designed us welcome Why don't you appreciate Why don't you appreciate God for that I think uh, the worst kind of ridicule that one can ever get is if someone comes to you believing that you are actually capable of offering them the help they need but you become unable to offer that assistance they come to you with all the faith that you are actually in a position to help they come to you as their last resort but you are unable and that is why the father got angry and says i came to you thinking that you would help us thinking you would heal my son i came to you my hope and faith was in you you were unable and he is very offended and that is why he gets to ridicule even jesus by saying jesus if you can heal him because he i'm not sure he believes right now that jesus can actually heal him because if you are disciples who stay with you who walk with you who have seen you do things who have been with you all this time who we believed could actually do it and we do not need to disturb you but now they are unable i even doubt whether you are able yourself and that has caused all these problems in church because the world believes that we have a solution the communities out there look to us to give them solutions people come to your homes asking for prayers and asking you to help them but what do they find you doing they find you arguing arguing over who is the greatest arguing over positions arguing over who can do what but the work of god and the community is suffering and in the end we get a ridicule and god gets a ridicule So people come to church perhaps something can happen not believing that it can happen perhaps if you can let me just try church maybe god may not believing that he will and we give people options and church becomes another option christ becomes another option god becomes another option not the only way he becomes an option perhaps he may i have tried this i have tried that and i will perhaps try church maybe it's a sad state 
that we have an unbelieving generation and I'm praying to God that the ones that are hearing this message will not be part of the unbelieving generation. We will be the pillar of hope, we will be the lights of the world, we will be the salt of the world, we will be the hope of our communities. We will be the people that change and transform our nation. We will be the people who the society runs to. Not per adventure, but because we have the way. Because we know the way. Because we are able. Just ask God to help you to be that person. Not to be part of the unbelieving generation. Not to be that that causes God to be ridiculed. Not to be the one that causes church to be ridiculed. That we do things as God wants them to do. And, and Jesus is rebuking the faithless people. You faithless people. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I teach you what to do? You have a responsibility to stand in the gap. You have a responsibility to help the nations around you. To help the community around you. May God give us the grace. Father Lord in Jesus name. We thank you for your word which we have heard this day challenging us oh god and our faith and belief in you challenging us oh god into you into knowing you into knowing our positions in you into knowing our ability in you into knowing what we are capable of oh god and we thank you because you have given us the power to step and to stamp to to step on scorpions and by no means they sh shall they hurt us you have given us the power to bring strongholds down you have given us the power to cast out you have given us to bind you have given us the power to change communities to be the salt of this world to be the light upon this world oh god we ask you that in jesus name you may give us the power and the ability to do it as you would have done it. Lord, you have given us this responsibility. As Christians, oh God, we have this responsibility that we cannot avoid. It is upon our lives. We ask you, oh God, to increase our faith. That the communities around us may be affected and impacted in the name of Jesus. We pray for every unbelieving person. They that don't believe in the abilities that you've given them, may you strengthen them. I pray the Lord, those that are lacking in prayer, those that are lagging behind, those that are lagging behind and are unable to do things because their hearts are filthy and are defiled, and thus they are unable to achieve much in your kingdom. We pray the Lord you may forgive them and give them a grace, O oh God, to stand firm, to move in your faith, to move in your action, to remain firmly rooted in you, that their faith will not be shaken. And I pray the Lord you may give the church an impact in the society. I pray the Lord there will be no more ridicule for the church. I pray that we may offer solutions that are needed for our communities. Offer solutions to leadership. Offer solutions to governance. Offer solutions to business, the business community. Offer solutions all around us. May we promote the kingdom of God by our living, by our abilities, by the things that you cause us to do. So that, oh God, you may not be seen as an option to the needs of the society but as the only solution help us oh god and help our unbelief may we be found believing and in strong faith in you we thank you for the hearing of the word and the preaching may you bless the speaker of the word may you anoint her oh god give her more portion oh god that she may continue to bless us may you protect and preserve her in the name of jesus we thank you, Jesus, and we bless you. You may be there and probably you're not even saved. Your belief begins by believing in Christ. Your faith begins by believing in Christ Jesus. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and you would love to know him, you may raise up your hand and we will pray with you. Even those that are watching us from far, 
you would love to give and invite Christ into your life raise up your hand and repeat this prayer after me Lord Jesus I thank you for your word I thank you for loving me I thank you because you died for me I welcome you right now into my heart that you may be my Lord and Savior forgive me of all sin forgive me of all iniquity make me your son from this moment on I am your child wipe away my name from the book of death and write it in the Lamb's book of life and give me oh God the power to remain in you help me oh God to remain rooted in you may my faith not be shaken in Jesus name thank you you're blessed the Lord loves you may the Lord keep you and may the Lord preserve your soul and faith